are actually in week three of this series, and, and I'm already realizing, like, uh, I told you we were going to do some themes here in the book of John, uh, but we're not quite there yet, and so I'm going to do exactly what I didn't think I was going to do, which is we're going to dive into this There's so many details here uh, in this first chapter of John that uh, I don't want us to miss out. Uh, and especially today, um, there's this whole idea of the Lamb of God. It's sort of a unique understanding uh, that John brings out. And so let me just begin by reading. And you've got your hand up, your worship notes there. I've got the scriptures. And I've actually highlighted, because I'm still trying to figure out how to give you the best kind of notes as you want to pursue this later. Uh, so I have a point. I just have bolded out the names of Jesus that come to us through the book of John. And so if you'll follow along with me here. Beginning uh, with chapter 1. Verses, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I did not know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by him and said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus returned turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw what, where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, and it was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was the one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated to Christ. And he brought Simon to Jesus. And when Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Then the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets, Jesus the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Nathaniel asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. And then Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked before Peter called you when you were under the fig tree. I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathaniel replied, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. And then he said, Truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God descending and descending on the Son of Man. Let's pray. God, as we look at this amazing uh, work of yours to, uh, to, to this man, John, and his, his view of what's important for us to see as Christians today in the year 2017, may we see that this morning. May we see the role of Jesus that you've offered each of us uh, by rescuing us, by restoring us, by this idea of the Lamb. So this morning, as we unpack this, uh, send your Holy Spirit to, to equip us to understand what that means for each of us. A young and old, uh, young and old, uh, that we might understand your call upon our lives and what you desire for us to do. And may we have faith to see and hear to hear. And we just pray God, Jesus, in your most precious name. And all God's people said. Amen. Thank you. So before I get started here, I just it's interesting, um, again, looking at all these titles of Jesus. And unfortunately, in our, in our great hymns, there aren't a lot of uh, hymns that sort of unpack these many titles. Uh, so I want to share a song with you this morning as we begin the message. Uh, Michael W. Smith uh, makes me feel old because I realize that the song was released in 1992, which is like, wow, that's like a long time ago. But I remember when I first heard this song, uh, we may actually sing it a couple more times, but it's kind of got a cool setup because it's about these various names that Jesus is called by. And where it gets kind of fun, and I've done this, I can remember 
distinctly the first time I sang it was at, at our church camp uh, down in the southern part of Ohio at the Camp Piedmont. And then we had a, a guest musician in who let us in this. And it's kind of fun. And as you follow along, you see there's a part for the guys and a part for the girls or for the men and the women. And as you feel that, please uh, sing along. So go ahead.
and one of the reasons that song uh, stood out to me when we sang it the first time is it's sort of like, this is interesting, like, what part do I sing? And yeah. it's interesting that they actually pay attention and we'll probably sing it again in a couple weeks, but the guys only have a few words, where the women, they rule it because they've got all these details, so. Uh, but the beauty of that is there's this wealth of titles, if you will. Uh, and that's, I just, as I was trying to think, how do I, I want to try to get our arms around, our mind around this idea of who Jesus is, especially looking at, at John's uh, gospel this morning. And so, uh, this is, as we've got it there, um, and, and you might want to follow that through, because again, just for sufficiency of space, just to think through, I mean, in chapter 1, we begin with this idea that in chapter 1, verse 1, that Jesus was the Word. Uh, he was with God, and he was God. And then John goes on, uh, sort of down through that, that story, ends up telling us that he calls him the Lamb of God. And I'll come back to that in a moment because there's something interesting about the fact that John points out this idea of the Lamb of God. And then in verse 34, John the Baptist adds, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And then verse 36 contains a second reference by the Baptist, John the Baptist, Jesus as the Lamb of God. And then some of the disciples of John address Jesus as they call him rabbi, or what we know to be the word teacher. And then we have the first introduction here in verse 41, where Andrew is the first to announce the Messianic identity, that Jesus is actually the Messiah. And he does this when he finds his brother Peter and says to him, we have found the Messiah. And then in verse 49, at the end, almost at the end of the chapter, the chapter when we encounter Nathaniel, he says to Jesus, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And then finally, verse 51, Jesus himself gives testimony about who he is. And he says, I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God descending and descending upon the Son of Man. And so here, in this, this is very short uh, writing, this, this chapter here. In these verses, we, we have Jesus called the Word, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, Rabbi, Messiah, King of Israel, uh, Son of Man. Now, it's interesting, uh, I want to zero in th about this guy, John, because what's interesting is there's only two books in the Bible that name Jesus as the Lamb of God. And it actually is this book, the Gospel of John, and it's uh, John's... Uh, book that's at the end of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, where he talks about Jesus. And yet uh, there's a title that we give, uh, this sort of an old Latin title, Agnes Dei, Agnes Dei, uh, the Lamb of God. And you know, if you go to any uh, history museum that has any kind of archery at all that talks about uh, Christ or Christendom, in fact, I've got a good friend, Mark Zimmerman, who uh, is currently doing some work at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and I highly recommend you going because it's free. Uh, but he's actually been able to there put together a 90-minute presentation on, on how Christ shows up, Jesus Christ shows up in the artwork that's there in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Because that idea of Jesus, especially as the Lamb of God, is something that many painters and many uh, musicians have written about and expressed about. And so we just see here though this correlation between this, this gospel writer John and John who wrote the book of Revelation. In fact, John says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, and it was actually sort of our call to worship this morning, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, that received power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. See, it's in this vision of this heavenly throne room of God that Jesus is honored as the Lamb of God. The title Lamb of God is kind of interesting though, uh, and just doing some you know, sermon prep for this. Uh, there's a lot of controversy behind this because uh, nowhere in the Old Testament do we find a lamb being used for the removal of sin. Goats and wolves are in the Old Testament practices and the sacrificial system, even the idea of the scapegoat that was driven out, but lambs were not used. Uh, now there are some stories about messages, so I want to help unpack that a little bit this morning to see the correlation. So the critics suggest that the origin of the idea that Jesus is the Lamb of God takes away the sin. Uh, they actually think that the Apostle John made that up, um, some, some academic critics, uh, some, some Bible scholars. But I want to show that in the, in the scriptures it's very clear, without much effort really, but it's a little bit of a look to see why it is that, that's, uh, that we want to believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And it, it really hangs on this idea, even in the song has laid out all these various titles of who Jesus is of the role that he plays in our life even today and what we believe in. 
So let's just look first at Isaiah 53. It's, it's a, one of those verses or one of those chapters that I would go to many times because there is this amazing metaphor uh, of the idea of the Lamb being uh, offered up for us. Um, the, the writer says uh, here in Isaiah 53, 7, you know, th these things. Um, he was crushed for our iniquities, and that God punished him for the iniquity of us all. Significantly, Isaiah says that the, the servant was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened up his mouth. And Isaiah wrote these, these words hundreds of years before Christ, but, but those of us that know the story, as we look backwards through the cross, we see that indeed Jesus does, does represent that, and what he offers that. But you see, it's interesting here that, that in this, this big title, if you will, uh, that, that I want to help us understand because, again, it's a core element of who we are as, as Presbyterians, this idea that Jesus was our substitutionary sacrifice. In other words, he stood in our place. The truth is we believe scriptures that every single one of us in this room, any man or woman that's been born literally, should someday stand before God and hold account for the actions they've taken. And, and we know that that's true because the one thing that we share with every human being that's ever been born or will be born is this idea of physical death. And it's in that, that dying that we need to have recovery from, and that's why Jesus came. And so we need to see, but, but we also know that God's God of justice. And as we look at the Old Testament, we look at the idea of what it means to, to atone for sins, that it takes the offering of a lamb, literally a perfect lamb. Um, but let's just keep looking at this here. There's a couple more things I want to point out. You know, it's interesting that he, Jesus is not called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the critics somehow think that the Apostle maintains that he sort of invented this, that the Apostle John did this. Uh, and yet, during his criticisms, John the Baptist was himself a prophet. And I think, think sometimes that's where we get ourselves in trouble. We think, well, wait a minute. you got to remember, as I said last week, this guy John the Baptist shows up, and he's the first word of God in 400 years that is spoken to the people. And sometimes we don't realize that those words that he spoke to those men and then and those men and women was actually just like the prophet Isaiah or the prophet Ezekiel or like many of the Old Testament writers. So there's words that we need to hang on. So John begins to unpack that for us in a very specific way. And so I want us to see that, this, that there's two stories I want to just point to. The first one is in Genesis chapter 22. And we sort of know this story, but to remind it of. When God uh, called Abraham to go to Mount Moriah and offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice, Abraham, in obedience to God, was prepared to do just that. But what's amazing is that last possible moment, we know the story, after Abraham had tied Isaac, actually had Isaac help him carry all that he needed for the sacrifice, and you just wonder what was going on in Isaac's mind as he's, his dad is taking him there and he's like, okay, dad, there's, there's no sacrifice here to offer. Where are we going to be able to do this? And then just what must have taken place there as Abraham tied Isaac and laid him on top of the, the altar that he had built. And as he's ready, as we know from the Old Testament writing, he's preparing to plunge the knife into his, the heart of his son. God stops him and saying, says this very specifically in verse 12. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And it's interesting, as we read the story there, we continue to look at the scriptures, there was basically this ruckus that took place back behind Abraham, and he turns around and he finds this perfect ram that was caught in the thicket by its, its horns, and he, he's able to offer it up as a sacrifice. So again, it's this idea of sacrificial substitution, that God provides a lamb as a sacrifice. And we, there's so much that hangs on that for each of us individually, and that's partly why I want us to see this, because even in some conversations I've had this week, uh, in, in some of our leaders within the Presbytery and, and the things that even in our community and, and just even yesterday and Michael Palooza talking with some of the police officers but also talking to some of the parents that brought their children to receive the gift and, and to know that there's how, how wonderfully blessed they were by the fact that the community offered this opportunity uh, that life is always imperfect because there's these things that come against us that we might somehow think that, that that there's something that we're missing out on, or something that we've done to somehow sort of lose God's grace in our life. And I want us to see that part of that is just the journey of being human. And so there's this particular story here in Genesis chapter 22, but then there's also a reminder from Exodus 12. 
It's the second chapter of the Old Testament where God promises to pass over the house where he saw the blood of the lambs and the doorposts. You remember that story, Passover, the idea that, that in order for uh, in order for that last plague to come, in order to protect his people, including uh, including a crown prince of, of the Pharaoh, that God instructs his people to, of Israel to slay lambs that are without blemish and to spread the blood on their doorposts. God promised to pass over all the houses where he saw the blood of the lambs on the doorposts. And you can read that later. It's in Ezekiel, or I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 12. So there's this amazing imagery in Genesis chapter 22 and in Exodus 12. And, and we can find all sorts of other passages, but I just want to hone in on these two. Because see, the words of John the Baptist were informed by his knowledge of the Old Testament, by his understanding of the sacred scriptures. But I want us to see this morning that even these guys didn't get it. We should offer hope for us as we work through our journey with whatever we're pushing through, whatever our material needs are, our spiritual needs are, or our emotional needs. When we get that call because somebody's in the hospital, or we get that call because things have happened in our lives, or something happens to us because we actually, it, it, it happens to us, we fall, or we encounter pain, both emotional and physical. So despite the abundant kind of use of this, and despite the fact that John Baptist understood this, even in his own understanding, uh, he, he struggled with it. Um, so we have in this first chapter, man of God, son of God, Messiah, son of man, and so forth. But I don't, I want to say this as clearly as I can. I don't believe that John the Baptist or Andrew or Nathaniel or any of the other disciples had a comprehensive understanding of what these titles meant for them. They struggled with it. They tried to get a picture, but even particularly, it's an interesting understanding that John the Baptist, who, who we hear say right here, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If we hop over into Luke's Gospel, and we look at the story there in Luke, there's a point where John ends up in prison, and he's about ready to get his head whacked off. And so John actually sends a messenger to Jesus to say, Are you, are you sure the one who was supposed to come, or do we look for another? And the reason that John did that is because John's life right at that moment was in the gutter. And so there's something about that that should offer us hope when our lives aren't quite trapping the way, when we feel like things aren't working the way, when we think that people are thinking about us in certain ways, when we think about the fact that we don't measure up all these various things, that we realize that even these men who were able to breathe the air that Jesus breathed struggle to understand their purpose and their place. And I think, again, those are the words that we need to hang on. You know, and it's interesting that that Jesus actually tells these messengers to go back to John, and I don't have this in, in your notes, but it was in Luke uh, chapter 7, verse 22. He, Jesus says this, Go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard. Tell to him that the blind are seen, and the lame are walking, and that the lepers are cleansed, and even the deaf hear. And you know what? Even the dead are raised. The poor have the gospel being preached to them. So the idea is that Jesus is trying to offer, knowing the plight of John as he sits in prison, it's like, hang on. You just need to hang on because things are happening. And even though your life may be incomplete and it may be messy right now and may be coming apart, you need to know there's a larger story that's being written and you have a place in that. So hang on. And then we go back to what I shared last week, Jesus' call of ministry. Uh, it comes out of Isaiah chapter 61 where he says, and again, I don't have these in your notes, but it's worth looking at. Uh, Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord, he actually quotes this, that I mentioned last week, in the temple. It's, it's his first sermon, so to speak. The Spirit of the Lord of God, the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, those that are broken. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. It was as if Jesus was saying, John, okay, John. And he's literally, Jesus is saying, John, look, if you had really studied your Bible, you wouldn't be asking me whether or not I'm really the one. You see, your faith isn't great enough. The fact is you're looking at your own circumstance and you're not seeing what it is that I desire for you. You don't have to look for another one, John. You had it right the first time. I am the Lamb of God. I am the Lamb of God. And yet in that we know that just moments after he probably receives those words is when John literally loses his, his earthly life. But you see, we need to be reminded that our earthly life is not all that there is. And Peter was likewise confused. Uh, again, I love Peter because he's the greatest of the knuckleheads because he's really the guy I like to 
sort of pay attention to. When I did my walk to a mass, I sat at the tap table of Peter, and I, I took great joy in it. And I was humoring that, knowing that, yes, that's the name that's going to stick with me forever in this community, being at Peter's table. Because like he, I don't get it sometimes. Peter was, was confused. He gave his great confession at Caesarea Philippi in answer to Jesus' question as to whom the disciples thought him to be. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus affirmed that confession to be accurate and he declared Peter that he was blessed for understanding who he was, but it's amazing. But right there, right afterwards, when Jesus told his disciples that he was bound to go to Jerusalem, who was it that Peter said, no, you can't do this? Uh, he, Jesus is like saying, okay, look, he actually says, I'm going to go suffer and die in Jerusalem. And Peter actually, the scriptures say that he rebuked him, he rebuked Jesus. Peter says, that shall not happen to you. So one minute Peter affirmed that Jesus was the Messiah, but then the next minute he revealed that he didn't understand what that meant. So, again, the, the joy for me as Christ follower is that, that we are prone to the same confusion. And so for us as Christ followers, we need to look at the whole picture. The whole picture of who Jesus is, and we understand and see God's great love for each one of us. And that's the point that matters this morning. That each of us, no matter what we're pushing through, that we have this amazing understanding this God of the universe, who was raised high on the cross, as we just sang as our opening hymn, who we were reminded has all these great, amazing titles, and, and, and there's so many of them. It would actually, if I would start reading this morning the list of titles that are attributed to Jesus, because he's probably the greatest human being in terms of one of best titles, it would take me easily a half hour just to read through the titles that he has in Scripture. And so for us, that should mean something. It should impact the way we sit in this morning as we even begin to lean into the remaining moments here in worship, as we sing, as we give our offering, and as we greet each other, grab our bananas and go home, and lead them to the dead. Behold, the Lamb of God is here. He comes to take away the sin of the world, and that should mean something huge for us as his people. Because whatever we're pushing through, Jesus is there to meet us in. And so I hope that as we look into this book of John, that there's even more there that will help us understand in a very practical way. How do I live my life today? How do I understand? Well, we understand first this morning that here is the Lamb of God who has come before us, who, who all of eternity was waiting for him to show up uh, before us so that he could rescue us. And so this morning, I would ask you if you would stand and we'll sing a song we've sung before Jesus and just give those words to him this morning. Amen. 